Good morning. Thank you for joining us for lesson two in our evangelism training uh, program here at the church. And before we get started, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for today. Lord, I pray that, Lord, that you would just uh, give us a fresh feeling of your spirit today. Lord, I pray as we study to learn how to share our faith or to relearn or to sharpen our knowledge of how to share the gospel. Lord, I pray that we give an attentive ear. Lord, I pray that you'd write it on our heart. And that, Lord, that we would have a burden for those outside the family that don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so, Lord, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would lead, guide, direct, and everything may be done for no other reason than for the praise of the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you notice, this is lesson two. Now, this is week three because we had an introduction that I don't normally do to explain to you who are live streaming this and looking at this on your TV or your phone or whatever myth that you're using, uh, so I don't want you to get confused. So today, we're going to look at the, uh, how to develop a most wanted list. Now, if you remember last week, uh, we learned the first scripture. I didn't say memorize. We learned the first scripture, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, uh, Romans 3.23. And if you remember, I shared on that lesson that we never tell somebody, well, you're a sinner, because if you do, they're going to get a close ear. What we do is we tell them, I wish I could tell you that I've never sinned. I wish I could tell you I've never told a lie, never thought a thought I shouldn't have, and so forth. And as I shared last week, because this is important, normally they will say, well, we've all done that. So they've already admitted that they're a sinner. And so then you can go on and explain uh, how God is holy and so forth. So today we're going to be uh, talking about uh, starting a most, uh, developing most wanted list. You know, we ought to be intentional. We ought to be looking for people uh, that uh, God will give us an opportunity to share the gospel with. And Lord, you know, he'll, he'll lead a person to say something that will just touch our minds, our heart, and just give us an opening. And then we just go ahead and just be a natural thing. Uh, we don't have to force the gospel on people because then it's, we're trying to lead, you know, win them rather than letting the Holy Spirit win them. So it's a natural thing. And so I want, I want you to understand that, that winning people to Christ is not difficult if we're sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, even Philip, and we'll talk about him later uh, in one of the studies, when he, uh, he saw a man going across the desert, uh, the desert and he got to the chariot and he found out the man was reading from Isaiah, and he just asked the question, do you understand what you're reading? The guy says, how can I unless somebody shows me? Perfect opening. And he was invited and he, <laughs> he preached Jesus to him and the eunuch was saved. That's a natural, natural way lead somebody to the Lord. So we want to be intentional. So if we be intentional, we need to think of those around us first that don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So I'm going to talk to you this morning as we start about how to develop a most wanted list. Now, Jesus said in uh, Acts 1.8, After the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses. Well, all of those of us who receive Jesus Christ have the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has come upon us. He says, You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So he gave us the categories for developing our most wanted list. So the first thing we need to do, we need to develop our list and, and look at our Jerusalem. Now our Jerusalem is uh, your immediate family, your friends, your neighbors. Look uh, at those three categories. Then the next category is our Judea. Now Judea is your work associates, those you uh, do business with, and so forth. And then the next category will be uh, our Samaria. Now Samaria is those out-of-state relatives, people that we don't come in contact with every day. Uh, it's uh, out-of-state friends, uh, friends of ours, maybe we lived in another community and we're friends but we don't see them much anymore. Uh, out-of-state co-workers. Uh, when I was in corporate world, we had uh, several branches but I had several sub-branches under my branch, and I'd talk to the guys and the ladies, and every once in a while I would visit them, but I didn't see them every day. So uh, that's, that's uh, that category. Out-of-state business associates. So, you know, it's, it's those kind of things. And then finally, look in the remotest part of the earth. Now, the remotest part of the earth are those that uh, you, you meet on mission trips. It's those that you might meet on, let's say you take a cruise, and uh, uh, you meet somebody on a cruise. Uh, maybe you, you, you visit uh, another area, maybe like uh, you go to Australia like I did, and these are people that you'll maybe see once in a lifetime, you'll never see again. 
And so those kind of things. And then person X, you know, there's people all around you that uh, you go bump into. Uh, maybe that's uh, somebody that uh, you're visiting the hospital and they're, and they're, when you could visit the hospital and, and, and they got teary-eyed and you sit down and, and, and you, you ask them if you can pray for them, what's wrong, is there anything you can do to help? Uh, you know, the hospitals can be a joyful place when you go into the birthing area unless they've had a bad birth. But it can also be a very sad place because you're around people who are sick and relatives are hurting for those people. And if you just be sensitive, you may be sitting in a cafeteria and you notice that somebody is uh, downtrodden and, and you know, it's, it's not hard to just say, I, I, I see you a little sad, is there anything I can do to help you? Man, that opens up a door. Um, I was sitting in a restaurant one time with a group having a meeting and we noticed two tables over from us was a guy uh, was shabbily dressed, was teary eyed. You could tell he was down in the dumps. Uh, he was just picking at his food and uh, one of the people in the meeting said, you know, that guy's hurting. And we were having a meal, so we went over and asked him to join us. Later on, uh, we had the privilege to have him come and join our group in the singles ministry, and then later on he got saved. Later on, he felt the call to the ministry, and the last time I heard from him, he was a senior adult ministry in the North Georgia mountains. It all came from an encounter of noticing that somebody was just picking at his food. So that, that's, just, that's just an example. So we want to, today we want to uh, develop our most uh, wanted list. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, using the four categories, and I want you to do this at home. Normally, if there was a live uh, presentation today and people were in this room with me, we'd stop and you'd start developing your list. You won't get it completely, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to sit down, get a piece of paper, write Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Or you can do Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Put space. And then start with your Jerusalem, Judea. And, uh, you know, and you have this uh, on your, on your uh, uh, TV or, or your computer or your phone. And just write people you know. You know, the first time I did this years ago, uh, just, I mean, write everybody down. You know, uh, and I'm probably going to repeat, repeat myself. But don't just write down the people that you think you don't know. Uh, just write everybody you know. That's all I'm asking you to do. Everybody you know. Mama, daddy, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins. Second cousins, third cousins, grandma or grandpa, you know, work associates, everybody you know. The first time I did this, when I went completely through it and I looked at it, I had 650 names of people I knew. You'd be surprised how many people you know. It's amazing. I know people in California. I know people in Nebraska. I know people in Colorado. I know people in Georgia. I know people in Virginia. It just goes on and on and on. So you write down all those, all those names. I know people in Missouri. I'll keep going. Kansas, you know. So you just write everybody you know. So that's very, very important. Uh, and I'll go past that right there. Now, begin by listing all the people you know in, a, in, in, a separate, in the different categories. Now, after completing your list, uh, look at each name. And look at them. And if, if you do not know for the, the spiritual conditioning, for sure. Not what you think. Not just, you know, you may have people that uh, go to church with you. But you don't know if they're really saved. Our church is a field of people that are unsaved. My wife uh, was just a, a, a very, to me, godly woman, very faithful to the church. Two years after I got saved, she realized she didn't know the Lord. She had just joined the church. She, just, she, had, she had a belief understanding. She had a right theology, but she herself had never received Christ. She came to realize that. So don't assume just because you go, to, go to, to church with somebody that they're, that they're saved, you know. And, you know, I love to hear people's testimony. And I'll tell you what I found out. If a person's genuinely saved, they, they, they enjoy sharing their story. I knew a lady who was a member of a staff member, or uh, was a wife of a staff member. I was going through some training as a layman, and they said, share it with somebody before you come back. This is before I was ever in the ministry. And so I said, I'll call this lady. You know, she's, she's the wife of one of my ministers. You know, and so, uh, and I asked him, can I call? And she said, sure. And I was right in the middle of sharing, and when I got to a certain point, she said, I'm not, I don't have time for this. She hung up. Now, she would never have done this. I thought, what in the world? So I missed it to her husband. And her husband says, well, every time I bring it up, she, she gets upset. She said, I've been concerned about it for years, but I, we can't talk about it. I said, okay. Well, later on, after I was leading a course called CWT, she came on to learn, 
And when she had to write her testimony, she realized she didn't have a testimony. She just come up with it through the system. And during that study, as she learned to share her faith, she realized she needed to receive Christ before she could share her faith. Folks, our churches are filled, filled with people like that. So don't assume that somebody's saved unless you actually know for sure that they are saved. Just give you an example. I was a, a church counselor in Georgia as a layman, and we called the new minister of education. And he came down walking down the aisle, and the, the first question I asked him, I asked him about his salvation, shared his story. He says, I'm your new minister of education. I said, I don't care who you are. I want to know and make sure you're saved. He never forgot that. Uh, so, you know, when you say, well, that's ludicrous, that's, that's dumb. Well, you know, the Lord says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, we're in the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And we have a lot of people who believe and, and doing outstanding things, but they, they're trusting in an infant baptism. They're trusting in the fact that they went through some ritual. They're trusting in the fact that they go to church. They, they're, they're a church member. They trust in the fact that they were baptized, but they were baptized. I had an 80-year-old man uh, called Bill come up to me in service in, in uh, uh, Orlando one day years ago. And he says, Brother Herb, Pastor Herb, I've been baptized on the wrong side of the cross. I knew what he was saying. He got baptized, and then later on he got saved, but he never been baptized after he got saved. He had it out of order. That's like somebody putting on their ring and then saying the marriage vows. It's out of order. So I hope you understand what I'm saying here. So write out your list in each category, and then pray over your list. It's very important for you to pray over your list. And uh, after you have completed your list, uh, put it, uh, pray over it. Pull, pick out 10 people. You know, separate the people that you absolutely know for sure. Just absolutely know for sure. And just, you know, just, you, know you can still pray for them, but just take those out of the list. And then the list that you got left, then what you want to do is you want to pray over that list. And then from that list, and I'm just going to, if I don't follow the slide, you have to forgive me, uh, pull out 10 to put on your most wanted list. You want to start with 10. Let's say you have 200, 300, 400 people, which you could have if you do this correctly, but there's no way that you can manage that. You continue to pray for your list, but you pull 10 out. And then you pray over the 10. And, 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 and it's on your most wanted list. And then out of that 10, you choose three. So now you pull three out. And you pray over those three. And then after you pray over the three, you pull the one out. The one is, and you pray for, and the one you, you, you cry out, Lord, the one you're intentional about, the one is the one that you really want to see saved. You, you really want to see that individual saved. It's, it's so important for you to see that person saved. You pray for them. You take opportunities. You ask God to open the door. Now, that doesn't mean if one of the other folks' doors open that you say, well, hey, I can't talk to you right now because I'm just praying for the one. You don't do that. Now, let, let me share a, a quick illustration. When I uh, went to a church in, uh, to, to be a minister of evangelism in that church in uh, Georgia, the pastor shared, said, one of our deacons who you'll really love, who's a real soul winner, is in the hospital. He's dying. He has a stomach tumor. And I know he would enjoy a visit from you, and I know you'd enjoy him because he, he has the same spirit you have. I said, well, I'll go see him. And I, I went to the hospital, and, uh, you know, the doctors and nurses were in there. And uh, when I, so I backed up. I waited in the hall, and they were in there for a long time. And then they came out, and they stood in front of the door so I couldn't bust through them, and they were talking about his condition, and then they walked down the hall. So I walked in the door, and there was Brother James, and he was just weeping. He was just crying, and he's laying on his back, and it looked like he was pregnant. He had, you know, he had a big, bad stomach tumor. And so immediately I thought, well, he's got really bad news. And so I went up and I introduced myself, and I told him I was his new uh, minister of evangelism at the church and also minister to the singles and whatever else I was doing. And I said, you must have really got bad news. He said, oh, no. He said, I got the bad news a long time ago. He says, Pastor Herb, I'm not, I'm not crying. And I'm not weeping because what the doctor told me. I've known that for a long time. Open that door for me, drawer for me, and I open the drawer. He says, you see that sheet of paper in there? There's a crumbled sheet of paper in there. He says, give that sheet of paper to me, that pencil. And I handed it to him. <laughs> I never forget this. He took that pencil and he drew a line on a name. He says, Pastor Herb, when I came in here, I made me a list of the people that I want to see to come know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I can't go visit them, but I can sit here and I can, I can lay here and pray for them every day. And the reason that I'm weeping is because after, as soon as the doctor left, I got a phone call. And it's a fellow that I've been praying for who I've talked to in the past to call me just want to let me know that he'd received Jesus Christ today. And I looked at his list and it had nine names 
nine names scratched off, one name remaining. And he says, that's my mother-in-law. And she's hard. She's, she's an uh, immigrant from Germany. Uh, I've tried to talk to her, but she's just hard. She has her faith, and she's not going to be moved. Would you go visit her? I said, I will. And I went and tried to share the gospel. She was. She was hard. A year later, we had a senior adult minister come in who was in his 80s on senior adult day to preach. And her daughter-in-law, this gentleman's wife, mentioned it. And she said, well, she never heard an 80-year-old man preach, so she came to the service. At the end of that service, that dear, sweet German lady with tears in her eyes came down the aisle and prayed to receive Christ. <laughs> and I looked. I said, well, James, your list is complete. See, folks, prayer is effective, but we have to do more than praying. We have to go and, and talk to them. So, you know, this is the one that you want most of all. Uh, however, you will continue to pray over the entire list because th those are your most wanted people. And then when, you, when your number one receives Christ, you take somebody from your number three, put it as your number one, take somebody from your, big, uh, from, your, uh, from your ten, put it on three, and take someone from your big list and put it on ten. And you just keep revolving. And then you keep adding to the big list. See, folks, that's intentional. That's being on mission for God. That's letting God use you through the power of God to bring people to Jesus. And you'll be surprised. You'll be amazed how many people God will make receptive and you'll be able to receive, to, to lead to Christ. We got to get intentional. We got to get out of the pew. We got in the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. We need to be a force of God, an army of God, trying to share the gospel with people. It's imperative, especially in this day we live in. You know, we sing onward Christian soldiers, but we, we're not marching. We're watching the parade. We say, I love to tell the story, but we don't tell the story. We sing about it, but we never do it. Now, I'm not going to take up an offering, but if you want to give me, no, I'm just teasing. So anyway, let's, let's look at the personal barriers to uh, the, sharing the gospel. I'm just going to go ahead and look at my screen, read so I won't miss anything. Please forgive me. It says, first is fear. People are afraid. You know, the Bible tells us God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us a spirit of love and, and, and so forth. I just want to dwell on love. If we love those around us, we don't want any of our family to go and die and be separated from God. If we don't want any of our associates, if we want anybody, if we have a burden, ask God to give you a burden. You know, and a, a, a little fear is good. Now, people say, well, Brother Herb, it's so easy for you. No, it's not. It's not. I've been, I've been doing this from the time I was a layman. I've been doing this for over 50 years, going and sharing with people around me and going, making visits. You know, we have a visitation program here at church until the virus came up. And uh, people say, it's, it's so easy. No. And, you know, every time I get in the car, I have, a, I have an added burden because I got people with me that expe have great expectation of watching Brother Herb. And if I take him out, I said, no, I'm going to watch you. But here's the thing. You're going up to a door. You don't know who's behind that door. You, you know, you've never met him. You knock on the door. Now, we, we assume, and I'll talk about this later, that something bad's going to happen. Very seldom happens. Very seldom happens. So, you know, and I've come to realize that a little fear is good because then I'm not doing it as, quote, a professional. I'm having to rely on the Holy Spirit and I have to rely on God. You know, Paul said that he was in court, he was there with fear and trembling, and he's going to leave. But God said, you stay here because i got many people here. I got people receptive, and he stayed. But he tells you, he, had, he was in fear and trembling. <laughs> Folks, every time I stand in the pulpit, every time I teach a Bible study, I have a little anxiety. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. So anyway, then perceptions. We think that we're going to have a bad experience. We think that somebody's going to slam the door in our face. We think somebody's going to chew us out. Ladies and gentlemen, that very, 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 I mean, it might happen, but it's very, very, very seldom. I remember making one visit in Georgia years ago with a team and knocked on the door. And I know there was a lot of noise inside. The guy came up in the door and I told him, we're from First Baptist. Boom, he slammed the door. And scared the two trainees I had. I said, that's unusual. There's got to be a reason for that. So we went to another visit and it was a great visit. I said, see, this is great. We had one but bad, but wasn't the one bad good for the, the good one? They said, oh, yeah, wasn't it worth it? Yeah. But it bothered me. I don't like to be bothered. So during the week, I went and knocked on the door in the evening on my own to apologize to the guy if I offended him. I knocked on the door, and I said, sir, I don't know if you remember me, 
but if I offended you, I want to apologize. I, I would never do it. He said, no, no. He said, I'm so glad you came back. He said, it has bothered me. My wife and I were right in the midst of a terrible argument. I was so angry. And you came door, and you, the first words out of your mouth, I didn't want to hear anything. I just slammed the door. And you know what? That's been bothering me for two days. And so I had an opportunity to share the gospel. Found out that he was, he was a Christian, but he'd fallen away. But because of that visit, he got back among God's people. See, you never know what's happening. So don't be afraid. Of, don't, don't worry about your perceptions. Then you got shyness and personality. Well, we got people that are very intimidated. They, you know, I have a wife who's beautiful. Everybody, you know, they, my people love my wife. But she's an extreme introvert. She, if I want to have somebody in my house, I've learned this over the years. After 50, 80 years, I learned this. It's not that she's unsociable, but she don't like surprises. If I, if I say, hey, I've invited uh, Jeff and Ginger over the house tonight uh, uh, for, you know, some snacks, she, she, she get, uh, she, she'll be glad to see me. She'll get a little, why didn't you tell me? I'm not prepared. Sorry, honey, I shouldn't have said it that way. But if I tell her, hey, honey, next week, I want to have Jen, uh, Jeff and Ginger, so I'm, I'm going to have to ask them if that's all right. She's looking forward to it. Everything in the house good. She's got her snacks ready, everything. She's looking forward because she loves Ginger, and, and, and she, she tolerates Jeff. No, I'm teasing. She loves Ginger and Jeff. But you can't, but you can't surprise my wife because she's so introverted. She's got to, she's got to get used to the idea. She's, a, she's an extreme. And so there's people like that. But sometimes these make the best witnesses because they're going beyond their comfort zone, and they're going because God has told them to go, and they want to be obedient. And so one of the best soul winners I ever trained was a lady who was so introverted. When even when she talked to you, she couldn't look at you. She'd cover her mouth. She went to training five times because she was determined, or four or five times, she was determined that she's going to share her faith. But every time she went out, it was her turn to share. She wouldn't share. And so the leader had to share. The other person had to share. But finally, on the last time she took it, I, we told her, said, you've got to share. You've got you to share. Take that step, and she did. And that evening, she went and led somebody to the Lord. She's never got over it. She became one of the best soul winners in my church because people knew that she was way out of her comfort zone. But she's doing it because she loved Jesus, and she didn't want to see people go into eternity without him. So, you know, then people skills. Well, you know, people skills are learned. Let me ask you, any of you, when you came in this world, could tie your shoes? You know the first time you got dressed and you put your pants on backwards or you put your dress on backwards? You, you know, I want to do it all by myself? And you got it all cockeyed? Uh, <laughs> when you were in first grade, could you read a college textbook? No, you learned to do those things. You learned to say please and thank you. You learned to chew with your mouth shut. You learned how to cut your meat. You learned how to uh, put food on your own plate. Everything you do in life, you've learned. <laughs> you knew nothing when you came in this world. I hear all the time, leaders are born. No, they're made. Now, you have some individuals that have natural leadership ability, but I've known great leaders who started out as no leaders and became great leaders because they learned. I know soul winners who became great soul winners because they learned. It's an acquired skill. And then you've got rejections. We're so afraid of rejection. Nobody wants to be rejected. You know, I, I never will forget the night I proposed to my wife. Uh, my wife doesn't do everything, anything in a hurry, and I don't mean to talk a lot about my wife, but she said, let me think about it. I'll be honest with you, I took that as a rejection. She says, call me in the morning. I said, okay. And I, I debated, do I call her, don't call her? Because, you know, I expected her to be, give me a hug around the neck, give me a kiss, said, absolutely. But she said, let me think about it. Next morning I called her, and she said, absolutely. And I was on a high. But before I called her, I called her with fear and trepidation. You see, you don't have to be afraid of rejection. And who are they rejecting? They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting God. They're not rejecting you. They don't even know you. But they don't know God either. But they need to know God, and they won't know God unless you tell them. So, so don't be afraid. And that very seldom happens. People, people, by and large, by and large, are gracious. They really are. So uh, not knowing what to say. Well, I hope you heard uh, in that induction where the gentleman said, you know, I don't always know what to say, but God always gives me what to say. I mean, I've been out on visits. I can't tell you how many times we're coming back. 
and we'll be talking in the car about the visit. Someone said, well, where would you come up with the illustration? I said, beats me. I never, I never even thought about it. I was teaching the Bible study today, and hoping some of you will look at that on Isaiah. And I started the Bible study with, with something that God brought into my mind that happened to me 40 years ago when I was going through seminary. It popped in my mind, which was a perfect illustration of what the study was about this morning. See, in, in Luke 12, 12, God said, don't be worried about what you're going to say, because when you need to say it, I'll give you the words you need to say. He's in control. And you've got more in you that needs to pull out than you realize. How many sermons have you listened to, and you may have forgot, but they're in there? Anything you've ever heard or saw is in there. But the Holy Spirit can pull it out. We need to remember that. And then time. I just don't have the time. Well, I've had people over the years, a lot of people say, well, I just don't have time, I'm so busy. But I notice they do what they want to do. You know, and I don't care how busy they are, if they, if they, if they want to go see a football game, they'll go see that football, they'll make time. Ladies and gentlemen, we all have the same amount of time. It's how we use the time. And if you stop and just take, just for a couple of weeks, just write down everything you do, everything, how much time it took. And then look, see how much time you used that was wasted time that you could have used. How many t things have you done that you could have done at another time to free you up to do the things God wants you to do? See, God gives us all the same amount of time. It's just how we use the time. And so we, we need to, to realize that. We'll do what we want to do, okay? And then finally, lack of training. Well, I've never been trained. Well, if you've not been trained, it's your fault, especially in our church, because uh, we try and teach this all the time. We've teach some other men. Uh, some other methods, and we're going to be teaching some other methods during this study. You just got to take the time to get training. Uh, just a few weeks ago, our whole staff went to an all-day conference. Now, many of us have been in ministry for years. Uh, all of us are active. All of us are on staff that went. All of us are on staff in some capacity. But we all went to the training. And I, I'll be honest with you. I've had the same training before. Uh, let, me, let me kind of share this to help you get the idea. Years ago when I was in Georgia, we were having this big marriage conference. Now, my wife and I at that time had been married 30-something years. My hair was starting to get gray. That morning, we showed up for the marriage conference. We were the oldest couple in the room. The oldest couple in the room. And all those young couples were like, what are you all doing here? I said, I'm going to tell you, I know this fella that... Uh, is, is doing this marriage conference. In fact, I have done marriage conferences. And this gentleman's not going to tell me anything that I don't already know. But he's going to remind me of things I know that I'm not doing. So I've come to get refreshed. Folks, we all need refreshing. It's, it may be that you don't, you don't know, but you do know. You just got to be put it back in focus. You've gotten out of focus. So that's the reason I tell people, it's always important to take any training that you can take and take it and take it and take it because when you don't use it, you get dull. And you want to stay sharp because you don't know when God's going to give you an opportunity to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. So that's the barriers we have. And there may, be some, there may be some others that you can think of. Okay, now let's go. We did Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Today we're going to look at Romans 6.23 that says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift, now remember, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you, you know, they've already admitted they're a sinner. And then you don't want to tell them the result of that sin. The result of that sin is the, the wage. Now, the way I explain it is a wage is something you receive for what you do. You know, uh, here in a, in, a, in a week or so, uh, I'm going to receive a paycheck. Now, I'm working today. They're not giving me a check today. I worked yesterday. I worked Monday. <laughs> but I guarantee you that in, in, a, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to get a paycheck with things I've done. Uh, God says it's a payday someday. You may not be punished the, at the time that you do the things that you do that are anti-God, but I want to promise you there's going to come a time that you're going to stand for God and you're going to give an account of what you've done, whether good or bad. Now, here's the thing. So he says the result of our sin is death. That de word death there means eternal separation, and I'm getting ahead of myself, so I'll go ahead and move on. Everyone has sinned. We must understand the result of our sin. What's the result of our sin? What's the result of our sin of not stopping at a stoplight and a policeman standing there, uh, uh, sitting there in a car that you don't see? Uh, he says, oh, that guy ran that stop sign. I'm just going to let him go. Don't happen. That word, that, that's a Greek word because 
I did it. I, I, I still to this day think I stopped. But it was kind of like he said, you didn't rock back. You should rock back. And I thank God for that officer because now when I come to a stop sign, I'll stop and I'll count 10. And then I go. That day I was in a hurry to get back to the church. I went home for lunch and I had something on my mind. And I probably, I, I think I stopped. But I don't think I, I rocked back. I just, that's what I slowed down to a minimal stop and then went on. Folks, we all do things like that. And the result of that is punishment. And my punishment was a $70 ticket, and I didn't have my seatbelt on. That was $90. And so that was $160. That's a good listen. But you know what? I always like to have the last word. That police officer was a police officer we used on Sunday to direct our traffic. And he came to pick up his check, and I happened to come into the uh, reception room, and he had just come in to get his check. And I said, Hey, I want to thank you for what you did to me, for me, officer. He said, what did I do? He said, you gave me a ticket. He said, you think? I said, yeah. I said, because I, I, I now stop and count 10. He says, good for you. He said, well, it doesn't bother you? I said, well, I wasn't happy. But, you know, when I realized that you worked for us, I just told him, take my $170 out of your check. His reaction was priceless. Of course, I didn't do that. But, you know, I like to have fun. So anyway, that's neither here nor there. So the scriptures say the result of our sin is death. The word death means we are Eternally separated from God. Eternally. Uh, because of our sin. Remember, God is holy, therefore he cannot abide sin. This is an eternal separation. God never winks at sin. He doesn't wink at sin. It's crazy. We, we think that, you know, that uh, you know, at least little thing we do, that it you know, that, that don't mean any difference. Anything we do, contrary to what the word of God says, is sin. And so we need to be aware of that. Now, there are only two places, and we need to understand, there are only two places we can spend eternity, heaven or hell. Now, we don't want to talk about hell today, but Jesus talked about hell. A lot of time in today's society, we don't even want to talk about heaven that much. In fact, we, we want to take God totally out of society. But you need to understand, there is no other place to go. There's only heaven and hell. The saints, who are those who receive Christ, go to heaven. Those who have rejected God's free gift, go to hell. Those who've never heard go to hell. So that's why it's imperative for us to tell them. It's imperative. I can't tell you how imperative it is. We cannot do anything about our sin. I can't do anything. I mean, I can repent. I can, I can say, I'm sorry. I can say, but it needs to be wiped away. It needs to be wiped away. You know, the sin is still there. You know, so we cannot do anything about our sin because we have a sin nature. See, we can ask forgiveness and they say, okay, but we're going to sin again. You know what I'm saying? We're going to sin again. And no matter, no matter how hard we try to do and, and, and keep God's perfect standard, we don't do it. We just don't do it. God has a perfect standard. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Our world keeps moving. Our world, we think, is getting better, but it's getting worse. It really is. And, the, and, and what happens, and this is what's scared me, I read an article years ago that the church is only seven years behind the world. You know, you look at what... Churches are finding it acceptable today. You go back 50 years ago, it wasn't acceptable. What does it mean we were judgmental? We just knew that that was not God's perfect standard. Not that we ever kept God's perfect standard, but at least we, we, under, we, we, we knew it. Now we got churches that, you know, they, 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 they're, they're thinking not with the word, but with the heart. Now we need to think, we ought, we ought to have compassion. But we need to understand that real compassion is sharing the gospel with someone so their sins can be forgiven, can be wiped out. Past, present, and future. Do you understand that? that? That's so important. God has compassion. He has so much compassion that he sent Jesus Christ to die for us. He sent a blood sacrifice to die for us so our sins could be removed. You know, soap and water can clean clothes. Only blood can clean souls. So let's, let's remember that, okay? So he has a perfect standard. Now, this is, not, this is the bad news, but now here he switches I have some really, really good news for you. You know, the wage of sin is death. That's eternal. But, but I've got some good news for you. And now we're going to, you know, there's that but. I love that but. You know, sin is eternal separation from God. But, and the but is, <laughs> the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now you remember, Jesus himself said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me. No one. You have to go, you know, because he's made the blood sacrifice. You know, I, I hear th these folks say, well, there's, 
There's, there's many uh, ways to come to God. There's many methods to share how to come, and I'm going to share that later. We can share a lot of different methods to share the gospel, but ladies and gentlemen, there's only one way. There's only one way. Only one way. And that's to come to God. Is that through Jesus? There's not many ways. And, and, and there's so many people, they want to choose their own way. You know, I don't believe this, but I believe this, and I believe I'm, I'm okay. Me and the God, you know, they say me and the Father upstairs are in good standing because I'm going my way. In fact, Frank Sinatra sang a song, I did it my way. Well, you may be thinking, I'm going to do it my way, but your way is not God's way, necessarily. The only way to come to Christ is through Jesus Christ. The only way to come to God is through Christ. Now, God has a gift for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. It's a gift. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. It's a gift. He wants to give it to us. Since we could not do anything about our sin, God did something for us. He did it. God wants to have a relationship with us. He created us to have a relationship. He desires to have a relationship. Can you believe that? Our God, the creator of the whole universe and all the universes, wants to have a relationship with you and me. He desires to have a relationship with you and me. Uh, that is why he created us in the first place. Now, therefore, he sent his son to pay the price for our sin. We can't do anything about our sin, so he sent his son. He sent the Lamb of God, without spot, without blemish, who kept the perfect standard of God, and therefore he was the only person able to shed his blood because he had a perfect standard. So we need to help people understand that. Now, Jesus came as the Lamb of God to die on the cross for the payment of our sin. You know, when I, when I hear that, and, and please forgive me for sharing so many personal things, but I remember... And please, I don't want this taken out of the context of this class because I'm still not proud of it. But when I came up, we used to do a lot of drag racing. We all used to be proud of our uh, souped-up cars. And I just bought a, <laughs> a used Oldsmobile that was fast. I mean, a buddy of mine got argued about who had the fastest car. So after school, we decided we we're going to have a drag race. And all the kids heard them, and they were out there. Just like you see in the old movies. Folks, that was a real time. And let me tell you something. I learned a valuable lesson, too, that day. One that he had the fastest car. Two, that you get a ticket for going through a school zone doing 70 miles an hour, and you get a ticket. And I got worried about it. My buddy said, don't worry about it. I've got a couple. Just call the, down there at the courthouse, give them your ticket. They'll tell you how much you owe. Get a, get to go to the post office, get a money order, pay you, and it'll be fine, because this is your first offense. I said, I can do that. My dad don't even have to know. I went down there. I called the next day, gave her to my number. She said, let me see what you find. She comes back and says, there's a note on your ticket that the judge wants to see. So you got to come to court. Now I have to tell my dad. So I have to go to court. And I'm going to make this brief, but uh, it's, it's, it's in my memory. I stood in front of that judge in black gown, and he said, we're tired of you hoodlums putting our children at risk. Well, school was out. The kids, no kids around. But we didn't have flashing lights. If it was a school zone, it was a school zone. You didn't know if somebody was staying late. You didn't know if a teacher was going to be walking in a small town community. If you came to a school zone back when I lived, no flashing light, you still went 15 miles an hour back then. Now I think it's 20. The worst crime I ever committed that I got in trouble for was chewing gum, hitting my brother, harassing the girls, and talking in class. And he calls me a hoodlum. And he says, I'm going to make an example of you. And I'm going to give you a fine so large that you'll always remember this. Well, I remember it. And if you can't pay it today, I'm going to take your license. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you know what happens to a 16-year-old boy who gets his license taken? You have to ride the bus with the nerds who later on become your boss. But you've got to, you got to ride the bus. You, you, your girl's not going to ride on the handlebars of your bicycle. You lose your after-school job. You have to stay home. It's, it's terrible. And you, if, and you have to ask Dad to use the family car if you want to go any place, and only then, it's if it's something to do for the family. You're under real restriction. I, I didn't want to lose my license. No way I could pay that fine. My dad stood, came forward that day, you know, knowing what was going to happen to me. He said, Judge, I'll pay the fine. And he paid the fine. My ticket got paid in full. I kept my license. Now, my story will break down and tell you what happened to me when I got home. But that's another story. But the thing is, I did the crime but my dad paid the fine. I did the sin, get my understanding, but Jesus 
paid the price for my sin because he loves us. So he's the payment. Now, this is God's gift to us so that we may have a way to be forgiven of our sins. It's a free gift. If we do any kind of work, if we try to you know, do anything for it, then it's not a gift. It's like somebody giving you a Christmas gift and you say, oh, this is way too expensive here. Let me give you a couple of dollars. I won't give you the whole, whole price, but let me give you a couple of dollars. If, you, if he takes one penny, it's not a gift. So here's your homework. Now, I hope you did your homework last week because your homework solidifies what I'm trying to teach you. And I, I, you know, I run into some rabbits and hope you forgive me some stories. But folks, I'm dead serious about this. You need to learn how to share your faith and you need to do the homework. So here's the homework. Continue to develop your most wanted list. You know, really develop that list. Uh, hopefully by the <laughs> class next week, you'll have your one, the one you're praying for, the one you're looking for opportunities. It's somebody that you're in contact with and that you'll be able to lead that person to the Lord. Learn Romans 6.23. It's very important for you to learn Romans 6.23. Pray with your prayer partner. Now, hopefully, you got a prayer partner. That's part of your homework last week to pray for you as you're going through this class because Satan's going to try and do everything to you. Know, cause you, you know, a few minutes ago when we were trying to do this video, uh, you won't, hopefully you won't see it, but we had a telephone call come through the uh, uh, phone that we're doing the recording through. It's right at, a, at an important point. Do you think that was an accident? And it was supposed to not be able to come through, but it came through anyway. So you, you're going to be distracted, okay? Pray with your prayer partner. Share your story with someone on your most wanted list. Between now and next week, you know, you know, anybody on that list, I don't care. Remember, I said, put everybody you know. So it can be a fellow Christian that you already know, you know, because this is your most wanted list that you're starting to develop. Do you understand? Now, hopefully, you can watch this over and over again. Forgive me for just reading because I want this to be accurate. I want to go with the, the screen behind me so my words match the screen, except for my stories. But let's get intentional. Let's be all that God wants us to be. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share uh, how to share our faith. Lord, this is so important because, Lord, there's people all around us. Most people we know don't know Jesus Christ. And, Lord, you're coming soon. The time is short. The, the day is still day, but night's coming when no man can work. And so, Lord, I pray that, Lord, we'll get on mission for you. And, Lord, I pray for those who watch this uh, video that you'll grab their heart. I pray, Father, they'll tell their friends, they'll tell other people in church, other people in the community, that anybody can watch these videos. And then, Lord, I pray that the Christian community would rise up. Lord, we're doing good things, but we're not doing the most important thing. Lord, even this week as I was doing some study and looking at some statistics, I found out, Father, for the first time in 100 years in our denomination, we're down. We're down 200 folks. I'm not 200, 200,000 folks. Lord, that tells you that the church is getting weaker and weaker because, Lord, we're not a mission for you. So, Lord, like the first century, Lord, I pray and I ask you, Father, to just bring a greater awakening and use your people that in the highways and the byways we will share the gospel and compel them to come in. Through the blessing of Jesus Christ, I do pray. Amen. Thank you.